So, as you've heard, I work in the receptor group, and I will be talking today about neurotransmitter systems in brain function and what neurotransmitters and their receptors can tell us about brain function and also what happens in the brain uh, in, in dysfunction, the case of disease. So, words that I'm going to be using today and concepts and what do these things mean. So first, a neurotransmitter. What is a neurotransmitter? It's basically a chemical compound that is released by a brain cell and it can transmit uh, a signal, so it can transmit information from the cell that releases it to the cell that contains a receptor that is able to recognize this neurotransmitter. And this uh, receptor is simply a protein which is located on the membrane of the cell and um, it has a specific binding site for the neurotransmitter um, that is released by the, by the neuron that wants to send information on. So this slide here shows basically a close-up view of such a point where you, where you would have um, receptors and their transmitters. And in yellow, you can see the axon. So it's the, it's the uh, well, it's, it's the, the synaptic bouton. So it's the end of the axon of uh, a neuron. Uh, up here you have the, um, the um, so for example, actin and peptin fibers that help form this, the, the skeleton of, of the axon. You have in blue vesicles where the neurotransmitter is stored and these neurotransmitters, they are synthesized in the cell body, okay? So then you need vesicles, they can't just float all around the inside of the cell to reach the axonal button. They are transported in, in vesicles, which are basically just like little bubbles uh, full of, of neurotransmitters. And then you also have here uh, structures like mitochondria and, and so on, which um, help the cell uh, uh, create or energy uh, consumption of, of the cell. And then here on blue on this slide, what you can see is the so-called postsynaptic membrane. So it's the membrane of the, the target cell, the one that is going to receive the information. And uh, in this uh, membrane here, which is so, uh, shown in blue, you have these brown structures. So here it would be a cut through a receptor or this structure here, you're looking at the surface of the postsynaptic membrane and you can see um, this receptor. The space here between the, the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane is the extracellular space. And you see loads of little blue dots all over here. These are neurotransmitters that have been released from the presynaptic uh, neuron. And then they have to travel through the, 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 um, the uh, extrasynaptic space to reach the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And then they bind to the postsynaptic membrane and then things happen in the cell that I will talk about um, a bit further on in the talk. Now, in the brain, we have different kinds of neurotransmitters. So we talk about different neurotransmitter systems, okay? And the two most important neurotransmitter systems are that of the neurotransmitter glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, it's, a, it's a neurotransmitter that is produced by very many different kinds of cells which are located um, everywhere in the cerebral cortex and also in subcortical structures. That's why it's called a ubiquitous uh, transmitter, okay? And it's an excitatory transmitter because it doesn't matter to what receptor uh, glutamate binds, it will always, the binding of glutamate to its receptor will always result in an activation of the target cell, right? And then we have GABA, which is also produced by very many different kinds of cells all over the brain. Uh, the difference to glutamate is the fact that GABA is an inhibitory 
uh, neurotransmitter. So uh, binding of GABA to any of its receptors will result in an, in an inactivation um, of, of the target neuron. And then we've got so-called modulatory neurotransmitters. These are neurotransmitters that can elicit either an uh, activation or an inhibi inhibition of the target cell depending on the receptor to which they bind, okay? And the other thing that's important to know about these neurotransmitters is that they are not produced by any cell located anywhere in the brain, but that these modulatory neurotransmitters are only produced by certain kinds of cells with a very specific location in the brain. And in the case of acetylcholine, we have here in the basal uh, forebrain, um, this little red dot here should actually be further down because this is where the basal forebrain would be. But anyway, it's a schematic um, representation. So this, um, the uh, basal forebrain is uh, the main source of acetylcholine in the brain. So approximately 80% of acetylcholine that's produced by the brain, 80, 85%, is produced by um, the basal forebrain. And in the basal forebrain, you can distinguish different nuclei, which are called uh, uh, CH1, 2, 3, or 4. The interesting thing about the neurons in the basal forebrain, and basically about any of the neurons that produce modulatory neurotransmitters, is that they are so-called projection neurons. This means that their cell bodies are located in a very specific part of the brain, for example, in the basal forebrain, but their axons are very, very long and their axons can reach everywhere else in the brain. So although we have a relatively small amount of neurons maybe in this structure and although they are uh, anatomically very concentrated, the effect of the production of the neurotransmitter can be um, spread out throughout the brain. And that is what I try and uh, show in a schematic manner with this um, arrow here, okay? That, that the neurotransmitter is released overall in the brain. Another modulatory neurotransmitter is dopamine. And uh, there are only two places in the brain which uh, contain neurons able to produce dopamine. One of them is the substantia uh, nigra and the other one is the ventral tegmental area. Okay, and they're both in the um, brain stem. Again, these arrows show that the neurons that produce dopamine are projection neurons. So dopamine can be released anywhere in the brain. And the other uh, two important neurotransmitters that I want to talk about today that are also modulatory neurotransmitters are noradrenaline, which is only produced in the locus ceruleus, and uh, serotonin, which is produced in the raphe nuclei. Okay? Now, we have uh, different kinds of receptors in the brain, and uh, anatomists like to classify things. So the different receptors that we have can be classified based on different criteria. You can say, well, I want to classify the receptors based on the transmitter to which they bind. And that would be the transmitter being the, the kind of ones that I described in the previous slide. So then, for example, you would have glutamatergic neurotransmitters, GABA uh, uh, receptors, GABAergic receptors, cholinergic receptors, for example. You can also classify receptors based on the outcome. So what happens when the neurotransmitter binds to the, to the receptor? And that's where you would talk about excitatory or inhibitory receptors, which would then result either in an activation or an inhibition of the target neuron. And then we can, always, we can also classify um, receptors based on the mechanism that they have of working. And in this case, we talk about ionotropic receptors and metabotropic receptors. And I'll go into more detail about these based on outcome and on mechanisms of action now in my um, following slides. So 
If we classify the receptors based on the uh, transmitter which they bind, um, we could have a classification, we could have a table that looks like this here. And this is definitely not a comprehensive list. So these are by far not all the receptors that are known in the brain. And uh, glutamate, uh, GABA, serotonin, dopamine, these transmitters are also not all the substances that the brain uses for uh, signal transmission in the brain, but they are the substances which are released at proportionately the highest concentrations. Um, and that's why uh, we, they, we, I've, I've listed them in, in, in this table because they are the ones which uh, account for the largest amount of, of signal transmission in the brain and the ones which play the greatest role in um, enabling brain function. Okay, So then we'd have for glutamate, for example, you've got AMPA, kinate, NMDA receptors, then there are metabol metabotropic glutamate receptors. Up to now, there are eight different kinds of metabotropic glutamate receptors which have been discovered for serotonin, for example, here. I've li listed seven, but you must know that for uh, most of these seven different kinds of serotonin receptors, subtypes are known. So for example, there's a serotonin 5-HT1A, 1B, 1C, and 5-HT2A and B. So, so this here is really just a general overview of what's um, available in the brain to modulate brain function. Now, what happens when we um, activate a receptor and what is the outcome? Now, basically, the, the message in a nutshell of what happens when a, when a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, what happens is that the membrane potential of the target cell uh, changes. And a change in the membrane potential uh, means that uh, there is a flow of ions between the extracellular space, which would be shown like schematically here on the right side of the image, and the inside of the cell, right? And normally, when the cell it is, is, is at rest, um, there is a, a situation in which the ion uh, charges that are inside and outside the cell are maintained on the one uh, hand by simple diffusion forces. So when there is um, uh, 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 an equilibrium between the amount of ions inside and outside of the cell, then there's no flow of ions between both compartments. But we also have um, active transport of, of uh, ions, such as, for example, the sodium-potassium pump which uh, sends three sodium molecules from the inside of the cell into the outside of the cell, and it brings uh, two potassium um, ions in. And this whole mechanism is meant to maintain a resting state potential, potential which we know is about 70 millivolts, okay? And if a neurotransmitter binds to its receptor, well, then something's going to happen that is going to disturb this um, balance. Now, if a neurotransmitter binds to an activating receptor, so to an excitatory receptor, what happens is that uh, channels that enable the flow of of positively charged uh, <coughs> molecules will open. So you have a whole load of sodium ions going into the cell. So what happens is that the extracellular space, which was positive, becomes negative, and the intracellular space, so the part inside the cell, which was negative, becomes either less negative or if the stimulus is enough and so on, it will even become positive, okay? And then what happens is, so this black line here is supposed to indicate the membrane potential at about minus 70 millivolts, so it is when you've got the situation 
when you've got um, the resting state potential, if the receptor binds um, or if the neurotransmitter binds to an excitatory potential, then inside of the cell becomes slightly less um, negative, okay? And that's when we talk about an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So this little hill that you see here in um, what the membrane potential is at a certain uh, point in time, this little peak here is an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or also known as an EPSP. If the receptor, if the transmitter binds to an inhibitory um, receptor, what happens is that um, potassium leaves the cell and chloride comes in. So actually the, the intracellular space is becoming more negative, okay? And then you've got uh, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential or an IPSP, right? And if you remember the first slide that I showed you, the, the postsynaptic membrane doesn't just have one receptor and the presynaptic cell doesn't just re release one transmitter molecule, but you've got several receptors on the postsynaptic membrane and you've got a whole load of neurotransmitter that's being released into the extra uh, synaptic space. So this means that at any time point, um, one cell can, can receive or can receive very many neurotransmitters and very many neurotransmitter molecules can bind to the receptors. So you can have a collection of EPSPs or IPSPs all happening at the same time. And just depending on how many happen at the same time and just depending on whether if you have, so, so if here you have an EPIS, EPSP and here you have an IPSP, they will just cancel each other out and the membrane potential is maintained. But if you have uh, two or more um, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, then with a bit of luck, the membrane potential will reach a level which is called a threshold level. And we know that the threshold level is at about minus 50 millivolts. And if this threshold level um, is reached, then you have an action potential which can be started, okay? And this action potential is the point in which the information which was passed on from the first neuron, the one that released the neurotransmitter, has now really been passed on to the target neuron, okay? Because this action potential can now um, be transported along the target neuron up to its cell body where it then starts another cascade of events which would then ultimately um, result in the release of more neurotransmitters that would then activate other neurons, okay? So activation of excitatory receptors brings the membrane potential closer to the, this threshold value, and that's why it, it, they, they make uh, transfer of information easier, they facilitate it, and activation of inhibitory um, receptors brings the membrane potential of the neuron further away from the resting state, and that's why it makes the starting of an action potential more difficult, right? And that's how, that's how they work. Right, so what happens if we want to analyze the receptors then based on the mechanism of mechanisms of, of action? I said that there are ionotropic or metabotropic receptors. What are the differences between these two kinds of receptors? Well, ionotropic receptors are basically ion channels. And when the neurotransmitter uh, binds, so the neurotransmitter is um, this little... Uh, ball here, when it binds to the receptor, the channel, which was closed before, will open and then you can have a direct flux 
uh, uh, flow sorry, of ions from the extracellular room to the intracellular room. So for example, if you activate a GABA receptor, those uh, uh, an ionotropic GABA receptor, what it will do is it will open and then chloride, which is a negatively valenced ion, can flow from the extracellular room into the intracellular, into the intracellular space. Um, ionotropic receptors, they are, so, so they are um, ion channels, right? Now the other thing is that ionotropic receptors are normally not just formed by one single protein, but it's basically a protein complex. So a group of proteins that get together and form a, 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 a heteromeric or, or, or a homomeric um, structure to build this channel. Um, with homomeric or heteromeric, I mean that you can either have the same protein, like four times the same protein that get together to build the channel. That would be a homomeric uh, receptor type. Although normally, um, for the tr transmitter systems that I showed you on, on the previous slide, um, the receptors, receptor complexes are heteromeric. This means that you have different kinds of proteins that get together to form this receptor channel. And um, this then makes life for the researchers really complicated because you don't just have one kind of a protein that you have to analyze. You have to analyze different uh, kinds of proteins. In this slide here, this is a, um, a schematic drawing of a, of a GABA A receptor. Um, here I, it, I only show that subunits can be called alpha, delta, beta, but actually, um, or gamma, but actually there are also alpha one, two, three. So you, you have an, an impressive range of possibilities of putting these proteins together and building a functional receptor. And depending on what subunits get together, um, the receptor that is built can be more or less um, uh, uh, have a, a higher or a lower affinity for the neurotransmitter that is released. And then we also know that different parts of the brain have different um, subunit compositions. So for example, there are GABA receptors in the cerebrum, there are GABA receptors in the cerebellum, but the subunit composition of the cerebella and, and of the cere cerebral GABA A receptors isn't the same, okay? So then GABA being, being released in, in, uh, in the cerebrum is going to have a slightly different effect uh, to GABA being released in the cerebellum. And the other uh, characteristic of um, ionotropic receptors is that they have a very, very fast mechanism of action because the transmitter binds to the receptor the receptor just opens the channel and ions can flow in and out of the cell. This is very fast. It also means though that the effect on the membrane and on the surrounding part of the membrane is relatively limited. It also means that these receptor channels, it's not just that they open quickly, but they also close very quickly. So this graph here shows what happens. So the, the, uh, the little triangle shows the point when uh, um, Glutamate is added to a culture medium and here they are measuring the activity of the neurons that are being cultured and then they can see that the neurons start firing so glutamate is, is included in the culture medium here and then immediately you have changes in membrane potential. These here are 10 milliseconds. But then very quickly again, almost as quickly as the, mem as the membrane potential um, increases, it um, decreases again, okay? And the other kind of receptors that we had that we can examine are metabotropic receptors. Metabotropic receptors, the main difference to ionotropic receptors is that the metabotropic receptors do not form a channel. They act via, via a so-called second messenger, okay? And the second messengers are normally G proteins. 
So what happens is the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor and then the receptor, it causes a change in the configuration of the G protein and then this um, cascade of events that's shown in this slide is a relatively simple one because sometimes activation of a receptor can even then change level of, of uh, gene expression. So then uh, the, the changes that would happen here would go way down into the nucleus and you would increase uh, gene expression, for example. Here, basically, binding of this transmitter to the receptor ultimately leads in the opening of an ion channel. Only this ion channel and the receptor are two separate structures. So the fact that um, it's a second messenger system, so activation of the receptor leads to some changes in another protein, which then lead to changes in other proteins. You need more time, so it means that activation of metabotropic receptors results in slower changes in the membrane potential. Metabotropic receptors are, on the one side, easier to study uh, than ionotropic ones because metabotropic receptors are normally monomeric substances. So you only have to look for one kind of protein if you want to look at the receptor. If you want to see what happens with the, with the second messenger, then of course there you have a cascade of events. But if you just want to know, for example, the serotonin 5-HT1A uh, receptor. That's a monomeric receptor, okay? You only have one protein. You only have to look at the gene expression of one gene. And if you've got the GABA receptors, you've got to look at, at the expression of five different genes, okay? Um, speed. Yes, I mentioned that uh, activation of metabotropic receptors results in uh, slower changes. So here again, on the left side, this is the graph that I showed before, what happens when ionotropic receptors are activated. This is what happens when metabotropic receptor, also a glutamate receptor, is activated. Okay, So it's the same, the same neuron in, in culture, it's the same culture medium, it's the same amount of neurotransmitter that's included in the solution, but you, also, you have to see that here, these are 10 milliseconds, and these here are 200 milli 250 milliseconds. And also that this, that this scale here is a different one because these are 200 picoamperes and that's 100. But basically, even, even if, if these two graphs didn't have, different, didn't have different scales, this here is much longer lasting, the changes that are elicited by activation of metabotropic receptors. And it's not just that the receptor itself um, changes more slowly and comes back to, to resting state more slowly, but also the activation of a metabotropic receptor can induce changes in the membrane in a much um, um, bigger surface of the mem membrane surrounding the receptor if it's a metabotropic one than if it's an ionotropic one. And just to give you an idea of how complicated things can get, I'm showing this slide here, right? So, so the column in black is the one that you saw a couple of slides ago where we've got classification of receptors based on the neurotransmitter to which they bind. And then in, in the middle column here and here, there's the effect. So if, if it's an excitatory or an inhibitory um, effect that the neurotransmitter would have. And then here on the... On the um, column on the four, f far right, uh, you can see if the receptor is an ionotropic or a metabotropic one. And you can see that apart from glutamate, which is always excitatory, and GABA, which is always inhibitory, for the other neurotransmitters, binding of a single neurotransmitter can have an excitatory or an inhibitory effect, and it can also have like a, a fast effect if, it's an, if it binds to an ionotropic uh, channel or uh, receptor, or it can have a slower effect if it's a metabotropic um, receptor. So all of these aspects together um, mean that uh, neurotransmitters and their receptors really are 
very, very important molecules in signal transmission. I mean, they are the molecules that enable communication between um, cells, right? The other thing that you have to know, so this uh, drawing here just shows basically two neurons, and it shows that this neuron here receives synapses from this one neuron here. Um, so that would be the situation that you see in this diagram here. But in reality, one neuron doesn't just receive input from one other neuron, right? It receives input from very many other neurons. And um, although one neuron only mainly produces one neurotransmitter, so for example, in this example here, this neuron here would produce glutamate, so it would be a glutamatergic neuron, it can receive input from other neurons which produce very many other kinds of neurotransmitters. And in order to be able to receive these signals, this neuron here, which basically only releases glutamate, must express receptors for very many kinds of other neurotransmitters. And that is what uh, is, is uh, shown, meant here, with these different colored circles. So every circle there indicates a kind of receptor and the fact that a receptor can, um, uh, or a single neuron can express different kinds of receptors, right? This is one important take home message. Now, how can we um, study these different receptors? There are different methods that can be used to study receptors in the brain. And, I mean, receptors are only proteins, right? So you can use in situ hybridization, there you'd be looking at, at basically at gene expression. Uh, so the, the, the genes that would code for the proteins that can then uh, get together in the membrane to form a receptor. You can also use immune histochemistry. There you'd really be visualizing the, the proteins themselves. So if you're looking at, at a, a monomeric uh, receptor, then you're looking at the protein. Um, the advantage of these two methods here is that you have a very, very high resolution and you can say exactly what kind of cell in the brain is expressing that protein that you are analyzing. Um, but you don't know if that protein that you're um, visualizing with immunohistochemistry is really part of a functional receptor or if maybe it's still in the cell body somewhere, so, so this protein has just been synthesized. If you look at in situ hybridization, then you know you're looking at something that's happening in the cell body. You, you, you know that, that, that maybe, and it's not just in the cell body, it's, it's maybe even still in the nucleus, that the DNA expression and, and, and so uh, DNA is being translated into RNA. You can see an increased expression there. Um, if you look at immunohistochemistry, you're looking at a protein already, but you don't know if that's part of a functional um, receptor. And what we do at the Institute is we work with, with a quantitative in vitro receptor autoradiography, which is a very powerful uh, method because it allows visualization of functional receptors, receptor complexes, which are located on the cell membrane, so that you know that um, at the time of sacrifice, because we have to work with, with post-mortem tissue, um, that receptor that we're visualizing was really on the cell membrane and it was modulating the activity levels of that cell. The disadvantage of the method is that we can't say uh, exactly on what, on what cell um, uh, the, the receptor was located on because we have a, a uh, maximum resolution of about 50 micrometers. But we, could, we can look at micro circuits in the brain. And I just want to say a couple of things about the method because there are, there are some posters tomorrow so you can 
sorry. How do you know that there's a, is there like a loss that the person dies and doing this post mortem? Like, can you quantify the loss as opposed to the unlive tissue? Um, there is a loss, and it is receptor dependent and time dependent. Um, So there are some receptors w that are stable up to 72 hours after death. Other receptors, no, it's probably more like 24 hours. What we do is we only analyze, uh, if we're looking at animal models, obviously post-mortem time is zero. So there you don't have that problem. And with human tissue, this is what makes our work so difficult. Um, we only accept donor brains with a post-mortem time that is less than 12 hours. And there we know from different studies, these are studies that have been done maybe in 1970s and so on, uh, with, with animal brains, rat brains, rats have been sacrificed and their brains have just been left at room temperature for several hours and so on to see how that affects um, the different receptors. Right, so what we have is tissue. This is very important because it's a, it, it's a receptor that must still have its native configuration so it can bind to the, to the substance that we're using to visualize it. So the tissue that we use can't be fixed. It must be unfixed tissue, but unfixed brain tissue is very soft. It has a very soft consistency. It would be like if you try and cut... Well, if you've ever tried to take jelly out of out of its uh, the little jar that you the container that you can buy it in and then you try and cut very thin sections of the jelly you won't be able to right so with the brain tissue it's the same thing but we want to have very very thin sections so what we do is we shock freeze the tissue so we drop our brain tissue into um, we, we drop it into isopentane which is a substance um, which is liquid at uh, minus, uh, I think it's as from, well, it starts to evaporate as from minus 30 degrees Celsius, right? So it's liquid and we have it at minus 40, minus 50 degrees. We drop our brain tissue into this isopentane. So the brain tissue just freezes immediately. This uh, is, is important. This shock freezing is important because we, we don't want it to freeze slowly from, from the surface of, of the tissue that we're freezing into the center, because that would create freezing artifacts. So we don't want the ice crystals that are in the tissue, we don't want them to have time, or we don't want the water that's in the tissue to have time to build ice crystals, because that would destroy our tissue, right? That's why we have to shock freeze the tissue. And then what we do is we section this tissue in a large-scale cryotome. If we've got human sections, that's what you can see here, or just in a normal cryostat if we're, if we're analyzing so, so rodent brains, for example, they're much smaller. And what you've got here is a uh, cryotome is, is, is an impressive machine. It looks like a big freezer, so it doesn't look very impressive. It's, it's a very big freezer, and inside there you've got this mechanical uh, device which moves and pushes the tissue along this knife here. This knife is really, really sharp, so it could cut even through bone, okay? And uh, we've got an anti-roll plate here, so because we want our section, which is just starting here, to... Um, glide along the top of the knife so that we can get um, the section. If we didn't have this anti-roll plate, then the section, it would roll, okay? Um, and this cryotome can create sections that are only 10 micrometers thick. How many section samples do you use for it depends on what part of the brain you're sectioning. It depends on if it is diseased tissue or healthy tissue. It does happen that you lose that you lose sections. Yes. Um, 
Um, the sections are then four mounted onto glass slides, right? So basically here we've just put the section onto the glass slide and then you rub along the back of the glass slide and that melts the section and it sticks onto the slide. And then we incubate um, these sections with radioactively labelled ligands. And the ligands are just chemical compounds that uh, specifically bind to the receptor that you want to analyse and they've got a tritium molecule um, attached to them. Uh, you can also use other kinds of, of isotopes. You can use uh, iodide-125, you can use fluor-18, but we use tritium because it is, it is one of the isotopes with the smallest um, uh, diffusion and, and uh, emission distances, so it produces nice uh, sharp images. And then we expose these sections, these radioactively uh, labeled sections against films which are sensitive to beta emissions, which is the kind of emission that tritium gives. And then we get this kind of image here, okay? So what you see here are uh, different sections through a macaque monkey brain and you can see that there are some parts that are a paler grey and some bits that are a, a darker grey. So there where there's a darker grey means that there was a higher concentration of the receptor and, and paler grey a lower concentration. Um, maybe if we can switch the light, can you see the fact that this bottom part here of the slide, that it's not empty, but you can see like, like phantom images? <laughs> Is it a bit better to see now? I mean, it's, it's, it's good, actually, that you don't see anything, okay? <laughs> because what happens is, even if you have a substance that really binds very specifically to the receptor that you want to examine, sometimes when, when you attach the tritium molecule to it, it changes the configuration of that uh, substance. And that means that then, the, the ligand that you're using doesn't bind specifically to the receptor that you want to analyze, but it can also bind to other receptors that are in the brain. So it can also cause non-specific binding. So what we have is we have some sections that are used for the total binding and some sections down here which were incubated with the same concentration of ligand, but we also added another substance which um, doesn't have tritium to it it's present in the solution at a much higher concentration and it displaces the non-specific binding. So if here you saw like darker shadows, that would mean that the part of non-specific binding that is in here would be relatively high. And the fact that down here you really don't see much means that the, the, the ligand that we used here is really specific. Okay? And the other thing that you can see on this slide here are these little squares here, they are uh, uh, standards that you can either buy, that's the case of this example here, or we can make them ourselves in the lab and they are standards in which we know the exact concentration of radioactivity that's in here. Okay? So these are just films that remind you a bit of, of the films that, that one used to have uh, for, for x-ray images that you got from the doctor for x-ray images. So they are quite big, right? They have to be digitized. We digitize them. This is one of those films here. We've got a light, light source, we've got a camera, we've got a computer program. So these images then are brought from this film here into the computer and then you can do a quantitative analysis. And the way of doing the quantitative analysis is using exactly these standards here because they have known concentrations of radioactivity, okay? That is these numbers that are here on the x-axis in the graph. And then you can measure exactly, it's a simple densitometric analysis. You can measure the gray levels in each one of these squares. That would be then these values on the y-axis. And then you can create a regression curve. And with this regression curve, you can then get every pixel that's in this autoradiograph, you can transform this gray value into a concentration of radioactivity. 
And because you have different experimental days and you, you, you were working with a certain receptor and maybe uh, today you, you know you're supposed to take 10 microliters of uh, the ligand uh, that's commercially available and put them into one liter of buffer solution to create your incubation buffer. But you know, 10 microliters is a very, very small amount. And sometimes uh, either a little bubble forms in the pipette when you're measuring this amount, or sometimes there's a little drop of the incubation solution stuck to the outside of the pipette. So you want it to add 10 microliters to your one liter of solution, but maybe today you only had eight microliters or maybe you had 12 microliters. Now this is the kind of information that you bring in here. The other thing is that these ligands that we buy, they have a specific activity which is given to us by the company which makes them, which means the, the amount of ligand that's in the solution that they sell to you, how much of it is actually bound to um, radioactive uh, molecule, right? So these are parameters that you also have to bring into the equation. Uh, this image just means that we've transformed these gray values, we've linearized them with this curve here, and then when we put it into color, um, we've, we've also got this information here of the specific activity of the, of the ligand batch that we're using and the actual concentration. And that way we can transform the gray values um, in the images into, um, into concentrations of radioactivity. And um, then we can get this kind of images here. Yeah, uh, could you once again say how uh, uh, the amount of radioactivity comes up as a result of like and binding? I think I missed that part. So the receptor, so tritium blasters, the receptor, then we have ligand binding to this. No, 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 no. The, the, the ligand, the ligand binds to the receptor mm -hmm. and the ligand has tritium attached to it. Okay? So that's how you have the tritium localized to certain structures. And you've got more tritium where there was more receptor to which the ligand could bind, right? And with this formula here, you can work out, because the binding of the ligand to the receptor is reversible, right? So it follows the so-called Michaelis-Menten um, equation. You can, you can calculate how much of the ligand that was in the solution that you incubated the sections in, how much of it has bound to the section, right? Okay, and then you get this kind of images here. This image here shows nine adjacent sections, uh, uh, 12 adjacent sections, um, coronal sections through an entire human hemisphere, okay? And each one of these sections has been incubated with a different ligand. So, for example, this section with uh, AMPA, kinate, uh, not with NMDA, but with a ligand called MK801, which specifically recognizes the NMDA receptors, and so on and so forth, right? So now we have serial sections through the brain, each one of them, which has been processed for the visualization of a different receptor type. And what you can see here, and, and, and blue colors mean that there were low receptor densities, and high colors mean, uh, or red colors mean that there were high receptor densities. And you can see that receptors aren't equally distributed throughout the brain, but that there really is um, a regionally specific distribution. And if I zoom in a bit into uh, this part here, of the brain, and I'm just going to show three examples, okay? What you see here is, this here is uh, the so-called Heschel gyrus, so it's the part of the brain where the primary auditory cortex is located, that is, that is what this A1 means, so primary auditory. And what you can see is, like for example, these are the M2 receptors, you have a much, much, much higher density of M2 receptors in the primary auditory cortex than in the 
secondary or tertiary auditory cortex, okay? Uh, for the adrenergic alpha-1 receptors, you have the opposite situation. You have a lower concentration of alpha-1 receptors in the primary auditory cortex than in the secondary or tertiary receptors. And if you look at the NMDA receptors, well, you can say it looks a bit higher here than here, but it's nothing that really hits you like in the, in the face when you look at it at the first time. What you do notice, though, is if you compare the M2 receptor distribution and the al alpha-1 receptor distribution is the point at which the receptor densities change for M2 is the same one here where the alpha-1 receptor densities change, okay? So what this tells us is that um, if two or more receptors show a given cortical border, this border can be found at comparable positions in neighboring sections, right? But not all receptors show all borders, right? This is interesting because um, if we've got what we do is routinely analyze up to 15 different receptors, you can measure the densities of these different receptors in the different brain areas. And if you want to visualize the densities of the different receptors simultaneously, because the important thing in brain function isn't just what happens with the GABA-A receptor or what happens with the, with the AMPA receptor, we want to know what happens in a given brain region, the balance of the different receptor kinds. That's why we want to analyze as many different receptors as possible, and we also want to visualize the, the densities of the different receptors in a given area all simultaneously. So these dots here indicate the concentration of uh, this receptor or this receptor in um, that specific brain region. And for this case here, for this example, we've got the adenosine, uh, it's the primary auditory cortex, okay? Now, for the human eye, if we want to compare the different areas, this like cloud of points, it's a bit too abstract. So what we do is we, we join these different points by lines to make the balance between the res different receptors more obvious. And, and just to make the picture look a bit like tidier, we get rid of the little dots and sometimes we fill out the plot. And what you see here is what we call a receptor fingerprint, okay? And then you can compare receptor fingerprints of different areas. And if we look at um, different functional systems, what do receptors tell us about different functional systems? So here again, you see the primary auditory cortex, only this time then in the entire section. And up here, we've got the primary somatosensory cortex. And you can see that both cortices are um, characterized by um, much higher M2 densities than the surrounding cortex. And if I show you a slide with a primary visual cortex, so this section here is taken, uh, this section here is taken so from approximately the middle of the brain, and the one on the right is taken from quite far back on the brain, then you see that the primary visual cortex also has a significantly higher density of M2 receptors than the neighboring cortices. And if I then extract the receptor fingerprints of these different areas, then you can see that the shape of the fingerprints is different, okay? So obviously, that here would be the primary auditory cortex, that would be the primary somatosensory cortex, the visually, visual cortex primary is definitely completely different. And here we've got the secondary um, visual cortex, which seems to be more similar to the uh, primary one than to the secondary one. So the distribution of receptors in the brain and these receptor fingerprints are telling us something about the functional organization in the brain. And we use this um, to analyze a other more complex systems. And this is the case of, of a comparison of areas that are involved in sentence comprehension. We wanted to know if the fingerprints of areas involved in sentence comprehension um, show some sort of common pattern that distinguishes them 
from areas not involved in sentence comprehension. So we extracted uh, the different fingerprints from motor cortex, visual cortex, from, from different prefrontal areas. And um, basically, a receptor fingerprint, you can also express it like this here. This is just an Excel sheet in which you've got uh, the different kinds of receptors. And here you've got the different areas that you're examining. And if you've got numbers, you can do statistical analysis with them, right? And the statistical analysis that we did to see if um, the fingerprints of the different areas, if they are similar to each other or how similar they are to each other or different from those of other functional areas is a so-called hierarchical clustering analysis, okay, which groups uh, objects, in this case it would be cortical areas, based on uh, their similarity, the similarity in some sort of a parameter that you're analyzing. So in this case, the, the parameter that we wanted to analyze was the receptor fingerprints. So we want to know how similar these different areas are to each other based on um, their receptor fingerprints. And the result of this analysis is uh, such a, a dendrogram where at the bottom um, you've got Euclidean distance. Euclidean distances are simply uh, is a measure of, of similarity or dissimilarity, okay? And if you just look at this plot like this, well, it's, it's a bit difficult to see uh, a, a pattern in it. But if I bring color into this here, then you will see that everything that's marked in red, those all belong to areas which are part of the um, sentence comprehension um, network in the brain, okay? And you see that because they all are found together on one like main branch of the dendrogram, that means that they're very similar to each other and they're more similar to each other than they are to any of the other brain regions that we, that we analyze. So um, this further supports the idea that bra brain areas that have to communicate with each other to enable a function um, have a, a similar a neurochemical composition because that's basically what a similar receptor fingerprint means. It means that they are more similar to each other from the neurochemical point of view than to other brain regions. Okay, so here are a couple of, of the important take-home messages. The one was that a single neuron can express multiple receptor types for different neurotransmitters, that these different receptors uh, are, form, are, are part of a very complex uh, microcircuitry to basically enable brain function, and that the specific balance of different receptors in a given brain region um, is the one which underlies the functionality of that brain region. And um, it's now quarter past six, so I basically finished my time, considering that we started a bit late. We can either stop here, or I can give you one example about what happens um, with brain dysfunction, that would be a maximum of about five minutes. Or if you have questions, then of course you can ask questions. So what should we do? We go on. Okay. This is what happens with brain function, brain dysfunction. What happens in brain dysfunction is that not very many, all brain diseases that we know of are uh, basically associated with a uh, 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 disturbed balance in um, neurotransmission. Um, for different diseases, we know better what the disturbed balance is. Um, uh, for others, we don't know. There can be two different kinds of, of um, alterations. So it can be a case that just the neurotransmitter release um, is disturbed. Uh, a disease can be caused by the fact that the neurotransmitter is produced normally, but that there are um, 
not enough receptors for it or the affinity for the receptor to the neurotransmitter is changed for some reason. So basically the binding of neurotransmitter and its receptor is disturbed. Um, there are diseases in which both situations happen. There is a, di a, a disruption in neurotransmitter release and there is a disruption at the receptor um, level. And the other thing that's important to know is that normally it's never just one transmitter system that's affected by disease, okay? It's uh, very many. I mean, um, you'll hear, for example, does anybody know what diseases are associated with, with neurotransmitters? Have you heard of examples? Parkinson yeah, Parkinson and dopamine, that's a good example. And it mainly is dopamine, but not just. Uh, there's... Hunt, yes, yes. So all, all motor disorders are basically associated with uh, dopamine disturbances. There's depression, schizophrenia, yeah. Hmm? Yes, that's also a disturbed neurotransmission, only not in the brain. It's it's the pank it's it's the, the the pancreas. But it but it's also and then you wouldn't talk about neuro transmission because they are only substances that work in the brain, but it's transmission, yes. All right, okay. So the one example that I want to tell you about today is uh, dementia, which it is, is a disease that, that, that is uh, it's, it's quite a, a common disease because around 47 million people in the world have it, and it's, it's not just disturbing for the people who suffer it, it's disturbing for... For the family, I mean, if suddenly your your mother, your grandmother doesn't remember who you are, doesn't recognize you, it's not nice. And then, of course, it's difficult for society because there's a lot of money involved also in treating these patients. And Alzheimer's disease is a special kind of dementia, okay? And this slide here shows uh, photographs of a normal brain and of an Alzheimer brain. And you can see that they come from from two subjects, comparable ages, but this brain here is obviously not the same as this one because a lot of degeneration has taken place, so very many cells have died. And basically the first part of the Alzheimer patient's brain to start suffering is the nucleus basalis minor. The nucleus basalis minor was the part of the brain in which something like 85% of acetylcholine is produced, okay? And the two uh, top images on the slide show um, sections through uh, the nucleus basalis of, of a control subject. And you can see very many neurons here. You can also see that the different, you know, I told you that acetylcholine can be produced by different uh, nuclei within the basal forebrain. So the CH1, CH2, CH3, CH4, they can be distinguished at the, at the microscopic level based on the size of the cells and so on that produce them. But basically here you've got so a normal brain and down here you've got uh, the same nuclei but from a brain of a patient who suffered from Alzheimer's and there's up to a 70 79%, so almost, nine, uh, almost 80 percent loss of neurons in the brain of a patient with, um, uh, so this is a patient who died of Alzheimer's, so it was, it was a patient in an advanced stage of Alzheimer. So, so a patient suffering from Alzheimer doesn't wake up one morning with 80% less neurons in its uh, nucleus basalis minor than it had the previous day. That's the problem with Alzheimer's, it's a degeneration, so it happens over time, okay? So if you lose the cells which produce acetylcholine, then this can't be released into the rest of the brain, right? So here we see um, this little uh, dashed line here indicates the approximate size of the structure, the part of the brain containing neurons which produce acetylcholine. And um, the important thing is that all of these neurons project to the entire cortex because they are projection neurons, right? So basically, if you are losing your basal forebrain nuclei, 
then you're losing um, acetylcholine that's going to be released into, into um, the rest of the cortex. And acetylcholine is a, a modulatory neurotransmitter, which is very important. Uh, basically, it's, it's particularly important for uh, maintaining attention um, so you can, you can stay focused on whatever it is that you're doing. And it's also a particularly important neurotransmitter for learning and memory processes. So the interesting thing is you've got a loss of the neurotransmitter. So patients with Alzheimer's have a lot less acetylcholine in their brain than controls. But not only that, if we look at the receptor level and we look at the hippocampus in this slide, if you remember, Catherine showed it this morning, shows the hippocampus of a control patient and the hippocampus of a patient with Alzheimer. And uh, these are the M1 receptors which are shown. And again, the blue colors, cold colors code for low receptor densities and warm colors code for high receptor densities. What you can see is that there is a loss of up to 30% in the amount of M1 receptors. So these are muscarinic cholinergic receptors of type 1 in the hippocampus of Alzheimer patients. So these are, um, this is, the hippocampus is the structure that um, controls, enables learning and, and memory um, functions. So this is the this is one of the aspects where the main neurotransmitter involved in Alzheimer's is acetylcholine, but this transmi transmission or neurotransmission is disturbed at the um, neurotransmitter level and at the receptor level. If I go into a disease like um, schizophrenia, then life becomes very, very complicated because schizophrenia is characterized by, or let's say, um, motor disorders are characterized by not enough dopamine, okay? Schizophrenia in the basal ganglia, so in the subcortical structures that control movement. Schizophrenia is characterized by too much dopaminergic activity in these um, subcortical structures, but not enough dopaminergic activity in the cortex. Schizophrenia is also associated with changes in glutamatergic neurotransmission, associated with changes in uh, noadrenergic neuro uh, neurotransmission, and there have also been some cases in which the serotonergic system has been implicated, or, or, or alterations of the serotonergic system have been found in the, pa in the brains of schizophrenic patients. Up to now, the only neurotransmitter system for which no alterations have been associated with the disease um, is the GABA receptor. So this is, this is um, a, a, a neurological disorder or neuropsychiatric disease, uh, disorder which is particularly complex and we don't exactly know which if, if all these receptor changes happened at the same time or if there's one of them which is the main one which happened first which then led to, to regulatory changes in the other ones to change it. But so Alzheimer's is perhaps one of the easiest um, diseases to explain based on, on alterations in neurotransmission. And with that, that would be the, the end of, of today's talk, just to give you an introduction on receptors, their different balances, and how they can modulate brain function and affect dysfunction.